from plain notification. There it is. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this evening. We have a magnificent guest with us tonight, one who's going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration. And that this is back, he's back by popular demand. Uh, of course, we last week, this is first of all, Dr. Abdul Ali Muhammad, but last week we had so much, there was such a clamoring for the part two of these answers and his responses of the history of the Nation of Islam defending the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his personal journey and how it affected him and, and the positivity that he's spread throughout his lifetime. First of all, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa well, alaikum salam, brother Joshua, how are you? I'm doing phenomenal, Dr. Aline. This means so much to myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast that you would take time out of your busy schedule to come have a conversation with us today, sir. The, well, the first question- it's, it's, it's an honor for me to be here and I, I'm just blown away because uh, I was just here last week and, and <laughs> I, I never thought I would be back so soon. So I'm honored as well. And I want to yeah. say before we get started, um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when I'm a guest on a show like this on Zoom, I don't get to see anybody. The only person mm -hmm. I get to see is, is you. Yes, you know, yes, so I don't see the other people. I don't see the comments. And so when you shared with me the many comments that came in and the love offerings that came in, I, I was just blown away. You know, I was just blown away. So I want to say thank you at, at least 5,000 times. <laughs> oh, praise is due to a lot. Yes, sir. And we appreciate you. And I, I want to send you some more clips. Shout out to everyone who's always on the Facebook comments, the YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok as well. Uh, the, well, we picked off, we, we were picking up where we stopped last time, sir. Um, Dylan, you, we were in the 80s. You had just got the assignment in Washington, D.C., and you had dealt with the hypocrite situation. What what was your next plan of action as a, as a minister in D.C.? <laughs> okay, so we are, we're in the, um, the summer of 1982. Mm. And you see, the, the, the beautiful thing that made it so easy for me uh, to be successful in Washington, D.C. was that when I arrived in D.C., there was already a strong group of believers, mm. including, including your mother, mm. your yeah. father, your uncle. <laughs> they were in the original study group, mm. along with uh, Sister Savella, who's now Sister Adnisa, Brother Donald, yes. who was the secretary, Brother Simeon, mm -hmm. Brother Wally, who, was the, who became the editor of the Final Call newspaper. In fact, the first editor of the Final Call newspaper, Brother Askia Muhammad, he was in Washington, D.C. Sister Alberto mm -hmm. Muhammad and her whole family, they were in Washington, D.C. And then we had the, the pioneers, the, the ones that were there from the very beginning, from the 1930s, they were in Washington, D.C. to greet me. Mm. So, you know, Brother Arif was there. <laughs> Brother Jackie was there. See, see these, these are the pillars that are in the nation today. You see, but they, they were already there in place mm. by the time I got to Washington. And I met them uh, for the most part I believe uh, the first meeting was a study group at Howard University. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, we had a power study group on Howard's campus, but this was way before then. And, and so I came down from New York in my uh, BMW that uh, Minister Linward used to call my jet car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and, uh, and I taught a Sunday lecture. Um, I, I believe it was in Blackburn Center. I'm not the auditorium there, I can see it vaguely in my mind. You see, but that was my introduction to Washington, D.C. And then people like, like, like your dad and like brother um, uh, Jackie, see, they were already well acquainted with the people in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, for example, brother Jackie, uh, who's on the minister's research team, he took me around. He introduced me to all the movers and shakers in town. Mm. He introduced me to Marion Barry. 
he introduced me to the members of the city council and the school board. He took me, uh, and as a matter of fact, he introduced me to uh, uh, P.D. Green. Mm. Uh, people in Washington, D.C. from back then, if you mention the name P.D. Green, P.D. Green was the most popular uh, radio host in Washington, D.C. And then he also had a TV show, a local mm. TV show. But so P.D. Green was like the voice of Washington, D.C. Mm. Do you know that uh, Brother Jackie and other people, they, they introduced me to P.D. Green and P.D. Green, see, P.D. Green represented the real D.C. See, not, not the bourgeois D.C. Mm. When, under, when you understand the dynamics of Washington, D.C., there's the bourgeois Gold Coast D.C. But then on the other side of the river in Anacostia, you see, so you got mm. the real D.C. Mm. And uh, P.D. Green was the, the spokesman for the real D.C. So he introduced me to the real D.C. people uh, more than just, you know, the bourgeois elites. See, that's what's so wonderful about D.C. See, you have the, the elite of the elite. And then you have the, the common ordinary brother and sister. So I came into a very dynamic situation with dynamic people. And uh, of course, at that time, uh, there was no money. I'm gonna say two things and then we can go to the next question. So what was the way that we got our first money? We were meeting um, at the Phyllis Wheatley YWCA on Rhode Island Avenue. And that was due to the good graces of um, Miss Van Landingham, uh, who had been a schoolmate of Minister Farrakhan uh, down in, uh, what was that college he went to? Um, Winston-Salem. In... Winston-Salem, yeah. So, <laughs> so Lily Van Landingham uh, had been a classmate of the minister at, uh, at, at uh, and, and so she was the president of the uh, YWCA, the Phyllis Wheatley Y. And that's where we began to have our study meetings and our in our in our uh, mosque meetings at the Phyllis Wheatley Y. So we didn't have any money to do any better than that. So at the time, the acting MGT captain was a sister by the name of Joyce, and she and her husband owned a small farm in um, um, Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And so basically, the, just to make a long story short, we organized the, the brothers that were with us and the sisters too. And we went out to that farm and we cultivated that farm that summer. And we raised green beans, tomatoes, um, uh, onions, carrots, cabbage, everything. I mean, and it was actually a drought that summer in most of the area and most of the farms didn't do very well, but for some reason, Allah brought rain down on our little seven acres. It was a seven acre farm. And we were, we, we got so many green beans, brother, by the bushel, I mean, mean bushel on top of bushel on top of bushel. We were selling green beans in Washington, DC for $10 a bushel, mm. <laughs> $10 a bushel. <laughs> And, we, and, and the harvest was so much, we, we never finished the harvest. The brothers actually got tired. <laughs> but that's how we raised the first money to get the mom started was on the farm. Mm. And that's, um, that, that's actually how we used to do it back prior to 75. See, one of the things that we did say in Cleveland, Moss number 18, I have a picture of myself. We had a farm in Cleveland, mm. you know? I have a picture of myself. I'm I'm the assistant minister with a hoe out in the field. You mm, see? Mm. So so that's how we got started in Washington D.C. And that's when I realized that money literally grows out of the ground. Mm. It literally grows out of the ground. And with that little bit of money, then we were able to do some things. We got an office down in Chinatown, over top of a barber shop, um, and um, you know things started to develop. Now, the other thing I'll mention at that time that was a key to success, we were using Brother Jabril's study guides. And so the minister had instructed us to start study groups. So within about six months or so, we had set up nine study groups in the Washington, D.C. area. 
You see, so uh, Brother Jackie headed a study group. Uh, Brother Arab headed a study group. Sister Alberta had a study group. Um, uh, all kinds of people had study groups. Some, some people were Muslims who were heading study groups. And some people, they weren't even in the nation, but they were studying the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm. And so we had nine study groups all throughout the area where people were, were studying intensely the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so that became the foundation later of a mosque community because you were dealing with people who were thoroughly familiar with the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So then you could get on to other business because you didn't have to always stop and pause <laughs> to explain the basics. <laughs> so that was that that was the start. It was the farm and it was the study groups. Mm. Oh praise you so uh, excellent. Yes sir, Dr. Alim and I, of course I want to let you know people are showing you love all across the country. My sister Naima, Sister Miriam, Sister Leah, Sister Naima, make it God may Allah bless you family. I saw Malik and people are showing you love all across the country. But Roosevelt, thank you and to our YouTube family, uh Brother Kente and Brother Musa, everybody who's watching it and continues to like, share, subscribe to the People's Podcast. Okay, so Dr. Alim, I received a call yesterday from the current uh, student captain in New York, Brother Richard, and he was talking about how impressed he was with, the, with your uh, last interview. And he said, could I ask you, you spoke of the lieutenants prior to 75. He said, what, what did you do with training your lieutenants when you became a menace in DC? Like, like what, what was your focus on the military then? And what do you think the focus should be on the military brothers now? I, I think I missed the first part of the question. You broke up a little bit. Yes, sir. What do you think the, what would you focus your, uh, how did you pick your lieutenants? Like, what did you train your lieutenants the, when you became the minister in DC? And what oh, do you think the lieutenants pick? should be known now? Uh, well, actually for the most part, I didn't pick lieutenants. I picked mm. captains. Mm. You know, I picked captains and then I let the captain pick the lieutenant. Mm, mm. See, one of the things that um, I tried to avoid doing was interfering in the chain of command. See, um, appointing a laborer is a very important decision to make. And if you make a, a proper decision, in other words, you, you pick a person who's actually qualified for the post, well, then you should just leave them alone to do the post. Mm. And part of uh, the, the post of a captain is to, to pick his lieutenants. Now, uh, a captain has to be someone, again, who is very familiar with the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And if you're talking about the military side of it, has to be familiar with the chain of command and the proper use of the chain of command. So, um, the lieutenant, uh, and this is out right out of the lessons, you know, the lieutenant is your private soldier that is trained by the captain. Yes, sir, yes, sir. So you might have a hundred brothers in the mosque, but how many of them are private soldiers? Mm -hmm. They're the lieutenants. So now the minister of the mosque converted everybody in the mosque. He's the minister over everybody in the mosque, the brothers and the sisters. Mm, mm. And everybody that's in the mosque was converted by that minister or some minister. So that's how that works, including the captains, mm, mm. including the lieutenants. So in that sense, you see all of the believers in the mosque always belong to the minister of the mosque and are all are under the authority of the minister of the mosque, including the captain. So the minister has to make a wise choice of captains because they, the captain and the sister captain too, what I'm saying about the brother captain goes for the sister captain too. That sister captain or that brother captain is gonna train the private soldiers. In other words, those who become uh, the lieutenants. Well, now what is the, the, the purpose of training the private soldier? That is to say the lieutenant. Mm, mm. The lieutenants are, uh, see, the, they, they are your top soldiers. So now the captain is to train the top soldier to present them back to the minister who converted them. Mm. 
See, the captains can't be jealous and think that the men or the women belong to them. They don't. They belong to uh, Allah <laughs> and his messenger under the authority of the local minister. So if the minister has made a wrong choice in his choice of captains, well, then he got a whole lot of trouble because the captain's gonna be messing up and then he's always interfering in the, you know, in the affairs of the FOI or worse yet, in the affairs of the MGT. Mm -hmm. So it behooves a minister to make a wise choice of captains. So in my case, um, who was the, uh, 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 the MGT emeritus captain at the time? The sister in New York, um, Sister um, Amina Rasul. Mm. She had been the captain of, of the MGT under Minister Farrakhan in New York City. Mm. So who did I consult with on the matter of deciding on a captain? For Washington D.C., I consulted with Amina Rasul, so that I could make the right decision. Well, what about the brother captain? Well, I, I didn't know who to choose for a captain. I had had a great captain when I first came to Washington, Brother Wali, but the minister took him and made him the editor in chief of the Final Call newspaper. Mm -hmm. I was left with no captain, mm -hmm. so um, I had a. I would say maybe three interim acting captains. In other words, at the time I made the best choice. The problem with Brother Wali, my first captain, was he was too strong and the brothers mm. were too weak. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. And so the next captain I chose was a mild-mannered man. He was mild-mannered and he was, he was easygoing and more compassionate on the brothers so that they could heal from the, the rigorous, the super guerrilla type training of Brother Wally, because Brother Wally was a fanatic. Mm, mm. So then Brother George healed them for a period of time. And then uh, came uh, Brother Harry from Richmond, Virginia, who was a karate master. Mm. And so he came in and he, he fit in very, very well. And then following him came your dad. Mm. See, so now why did I pick uh, Brother William at the time to be the captain of the FOI in Mars number four? Because I was scratching my head. There had been a problem with Brother Harry and um, I was trying to decide something. So I said, well, wait a minute. What did the minister say about, let's see, uh, Brother William at the time was the business manager. Mm, but he mm. was also known for security. Mm. And I remember one time the minister said that uh, that Brother William, now Sharif, was perfect in security. Mm. So I said to myself, well, what am I scratching my head for I'm trying to figure something out that's already been figured out? <laughs> mm, mm, mm. So I asked him if he would become the captain. And the first thing he said to me, he said, well, why are you asking me? Why didn't you ask Brother Rodney? Mm. Because the two of them were like peas in a pod. Why didn't you ask Brother Rodney? <laughs> I said, well, I was thinking about Brother Rodney too, but you're more articulate than Brother Rodney. Mm. The two of you are equal, but you're, you're just more articulate than Brother Rodney. So that's why I'm asking you. Mm. So he said, well, I, I have to pray on that one. <laughs> And then the next day he came back and said that he accepted. Mm -hmm. And then once he accepted, what did I do? I stepped back, let him be the captain. Mm. Let him pick who he wants. He's looking over all the brothers. He, he knows them uh, in and out. He knows what he's trying to do, what he's trying to accomplish. Of course, we have laborers meetings and we're in consultation. It's not like he's on another planet. You know, they had this, you know, it's some people with a poor understanding, they think there's some kind of separation between the spiritual and what they call the military. Mm. No, it's not. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that uh, Master Farad Muhammad is the God of war. Allah, so what do you think that means? <laughs> <laughs> 
<coughs> so anyhow, that's that that I hope that answers the question. You know, you you pick a good captain and then you get out of the way and let them train the private soldiers. Mm. So now that that lieutenant that gets trained gets special training from the captain gets presented back to the minister who converted him or her mm, mm. to be assigned. That lieutenant now becomes a minister. That lieutenant now becomes a secretary. That lieutenant now becomes a captain. Mm. That lieutenant now becomes a business manager. That lieutenant now becomes whatever is needed on the laboring staff of the mosque and you don't have to worry about that brother or that sister because that's the top soldier. You're not, you don't have some old lazy person on staff that never had any accomplishments. No, that's the top soldier because he's the top soldier. Mm, mm. And he's got the statistics to prove that I'm the top soldier. And that's why the brothers salute me because when we sell papers, I outsell them. Mm. I don't bring up the rear. I'm not sitting back uh, sipping coffee in the office. No, I'm leading the troops in the field and they see what I do. And because I outdo them, they don't have no problem saluting me, following my instructions, because I'm the top soldier. See, that, that's a real lieutenant. Mm, so that's, mm. that's what we had prior to 75. There wasn't, no, uh, 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 there wasn't no mystery why Lieutenant Moses was Lieutenant Moses. And Captain Brozier was Captain Brozier. There wasn't no, wasn't no question about well, Lieutenant Johnny and Captain Johnny in Akron, Ohio. There wasn't no question about why they were lieutenants. They were better than you. That's why they were lieutenants. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he was the captain, because he's better than you. I mean, in, in the things that counted, the things that mattered, in the pushing of the program. You were selling 300 papers. He was selling 500. That's why he's the lieutenant and you're not. Mm. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if you came up and sold a thousand papers, hey, it was easy to change who was gonna be who. Because it was the, you know, the, the, there's a verse about righteous competition. Well, that's, that's what you had in the nation, righteous mm. competition. You know, righteous, yeah, yeah, you the captain till somebody can outdo you. Mm. You're the lieutenant till somebody outdoes you. And you were glad when somebody outdid you because <laughs> it was outdoing you in the pushing of the program. And that's all, that's what it was all about. Excellent. Excellent. I believe people will continue to show you love all across the country. Thank you for everyone's comments. Fantastic interview offers you to a lot. Teach. This is beautiful, powerful, mm -hmm. excellent. Well, okay, so speaking of that, I sent you a clip of 1989 Savings Day, Washington, D.C. You introduced Los Angeles Los Farrakhan. Everybody has the uniforms on the tent. And <laughs> this is this is post the uh, Dope Busters. So I want to go to the Dope Busters, but I want to go to where you, the way the crowd went crazy when you came on there, Rajnum, it was like Dr. Lane is minister in the city, he running everything. <laughs> what, what, as, what was it like being the minister during the time of the 80s in D.C. with the Dope Busters, and then we'll come to the Savings Day clip as well. Well, one of the most important things to recognize is that um, in addition to what I already said about how there was already a group of Muslims here in Washington who showed me off and carried me around with them and introduced me to everybody. But I should not also, I should not neglect to mention that Minister Farrakhan uh, convened a huge meeting at All Souls Church. I believe it was in August of 1982, where he swore me in as mm. the minister of Washington, D.C. Mm. before a, a turnaway crowd. I mean, with thousands of people there. So what I'm saying is that the fact that I became well known in Washington DC was no accident. I was introduced to Washington DC by Minister Farrakhan. So everybody in Washington DC knew me. <laughs> that doesn't mean I knew everybody, but every, you know, everywhere I went, people, people came up to me, they knew who I was. You see, so, so by the time 
of that clip. And by by the way, um, I never saw that clip before either. Savior's Day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now that was in October of 1989. So that was the October Savior's Day of that year. And that was being held in Washington, DC, because um, in the words of the minister at that time, Washington, DC was the star of the nation. Mm. Washington, DC was the star of the nation because we were leading in everything. Mm. So we were the star of the nation. And so we were honored uh, with the privilege of hosting Savior's Day in October in 1989. And Allah graced us uh, for the occasion because he caused the earthquake on the West Coast. That, that was the day of the earthquake in San Francisco. So you can mm. check the date out to, to confirm that. Now, um, the, uh, I, I, was, I was really taken by the video because it, cause I, I never saw that before. That was not what I mentioned to you under the tent. The mm. tenth Savior's Day was actually in Chicago. Mm, mm. This was actually at a hotel. I think that was at the Hilton Hotel Ballroom mm. in Washington D.C. I might, or maybe it was the Armory. I'm my memory might not, because the reason I don't remember, see, the reason I don't actually have until I saw that video, I had completely forgotten about that, one hundred percent. And I think the reason why I forgot about it was because, believe it or not, um, I was sick as a dog mm. standing up there. I, I had I I had the worst headache that I think I've ever had in my life. Mm. I had a, a, a sick migraine headache. I could hardly stand up. Mm. And so, as soon as I got off the rostrum there, I think I went somewhere and laid down. Mm. So. So I don't know, maybe it was the combination of the headache and all the rest of it, but I had no recollection of that whatsoever. And then, <laughs> and then of course, the, the, the lecture that the minister gave, you know, was just, you know, I think one of the best ones ever. Yes, well, sir, I, yes, I think most people would agree. I mean, that's hard, hard to say, but that was one of the best ones ever. Mm -hmm. Stop the killing, you see? And he, he went into the psychology you know, of that whole killing phenomenon and to bring it up to date. What are we faced with today? Except the world full of killers, mass killers. You see, he, he said in that speech, how can we stop the killing until we stop the killer? Well, the problem is we didn't stop the killer. Mm -hmm. So now they got these bioweapons, they got chemtrails, they got all, and, and it's not just killing one at a time. No, now this mass extermination of whole populations. So, uh, so thank you very much, you know, for sharing that video with me. I, I had never, I had never seen it before. Oh, praise due to a lot. Yes, sir. And Dr. Lynn, people are saying preach and showing you love all across the country. Uh, thank you all for watching. Okay, now I wanted to follow up with the dope buster question because we have a lot of questions for you. But what was it like being the minister? Um, press conferences. You know, you're, you're, you're. The face of Washington D.C. and it's in <laughs> every newspaper. Everybody's talking about the work that you all are doing in the community. Uh, what what did that feel like? Well, um, it felt frightening for the most part mm. um, because it's a heavy responsibility. You know, um, you see the just just to give you the the background setting. Um, I was not actually in Washington D.C. the day that the dope busters. Uh, thing broke out, what was that, April 19th, 1988. I was in Norfolk, Virginia, setting up, um, uh, we were trying to get the scope amphitheater for the minister's speech in Norfolk. So that's mm -hmm. what I was doing. I was down negotiating with the scope theater in Norfolk, Virginia, and the dope busters was jumping off in Washington, D.C., Mm. So the minister called me and told me, get back to D.C. as quick as you can and call a press conference because they're trying to turn this thing into an anti-Muslim uh, uh, crusade. They were trying to claim that the, that the brothers had beat up an uh, NBC uh, cameraman. You know, that's, that was the story that they were trying to push. So he told me, get back to Washington, D.C., call a press conference, which we did the next day. And, and we answered all of those questions and we 
we showed the truth of what was really going on. Um, well, in fact, the, the cameraman was right there that we had bumped into and knocked down. We picked him up. He was on our side. And uh, we showed the people walking around. And this had been a drug market full of violence and deaths and killings and robberies and all kinds of mayhem. And now it was a peaceful, beautiful uh, a uh, April day. And the children were playing and the mothers were walking around. And, you know, it was just a wonderful, wonderful scene. And that was the story. And because of the way that I handled the press conference, uh, the, the minister, that's when he named me as his national spokesman. That's actually when that happened. <laughs> and then he told me, he said, as my national spokesman, um, you, you are to accept every interview that you are offered. Mm. He said, don't turn down any of them. And so that's what I did. And I had no idea what I was accepting. <laughs> you know, I was thinking that, like, yeah, maybe, maybe Channel 4 is going to call me up or something like that. But before I know it, I'm talking to, to news reporters from Japan, Germany, uh, mm -hmm. Australia, you know, all over the world, from Egypt, from Russia, um, you know, because the Dope Busters was international news and for a reason. There had never been any case where uh, some unarmed people uh, had put a stop to drug trafficking. You just think about it. They can't do that at the Mexican border today. Mm, mm. But here we, in one day, we put uh, a stop to drug trafficking in really one of the biggest open air drug markets on the whole East Coast. So everybody wants to know, well, how did you do that? Well, we did that by following the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He told us how to do everything. Oh, okay. It's a lot. Beautiful. See, what, see, the way it happened, um, see, the brothers had been out selling papers in Mayfair mansions. And the, the sister who was basically in charge of the community, like the community leader, she said to your father, every time you brothers come around here, we get some peace. We get some mm -hmm. relief. The drug boys disappear when you show up. So is there any way that you all could have a permanent presence here so we can have a decent life? Mm. So he reported that to me um, at the staff meeting that Monday. And I said, well, Brother Sharif, I said, the Holy Quran says that charity is for those who ask. Mm. Charity is for those who ask. Because the only ones who ask for charity are the people who need it. And we have just been asked. So the question is, can we help? Because according to the Quran, if someone asks you for charity because they need it, and you have the capacity to be charitable, you're obligated to do it. Mm. You're obligated. It's not an option. Like I, I could, I could give the man a dollar. Well, if you can and he needs it, you should. And you're not the judge of him as to what he's gonna do with that dollar. But when we talk about charity, it doesn't have to just be money. What about good deeds? So the lady said she bore witness that when the FOI show up, the drug boys disappear. See, because two different things can't occupy the same space at the same time. Good can't occupy the same space with evil. Evil can't stay in the same place, place with good. Evil can only come in when good removes itself. Evil cannot remove good, but good can remove itself. But good has enough power to remove evil, whether evil wants to be removed or not. So that's all that happened. Now, now, Dr. Uh, King, Martin Luther King, when they asked him, how did he overthrow segregation in the South? Not with nonviolence. He called it soul power. Mm. He called it soul power. We did it with soul power. Well, that, that's the same thing with the dope busters. I told you, I used to follow Dr. King before I came in the nation. Yes, sir. I know about nonviolent resistance. And one of the things that have attracted me to Islam is that the very name Islam itself means peace. Mm -hmm. So it's a peaceful way of life. 
See, we, we like to militarize Islam, but actually that's only a self-defense uh, necessity. See, if we were living among civilized people, you see, we wouldn't need any type of military for self-defense, but we don't live among civilized people. Like Minister Theodore in Cleveland used to say, he said, prayer's all right in prayer meeting, but it ain't worth a doggone at bear meeting. Mm. So we always had to be prepared for both prayer meeting and bear meeting. Wow, yes, sir. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us that we uh, are to never be the aggressors, never be the aggressors. So when we're selling papers, we're not being aggressive, we're doing our work. But if someone attacks us, then we are to fight with those who fight with us. Wow. And Allah will bless us to be the winner. Yes, sir. If they attack us with a weapon, then Allah will bless us to get the weapon. And then we are to take the weapon and use the weapon against the attacker in the manner that the attacker was going to use the weapon against us. Yes, sir. So that was just the FOI training that went into the dope busters with the understanding that we are operating according to spiritual principles that Dr. King called soul power. I used a different term in the press conference. When they asked, well, well, what made the dope boys run away? I said, it was a compelling moral force. Mm. See, it's soul power. A compelling moral force. See, when God comes into the assembly, the devil has to flee. Mm. Can't mm. stay there. What did they tell you? They said, if, if you look at God, you're going to die. Mm. If, if you're a devil, if you're a devil and look at God, yeah, God will kill you with his, with his look, with his glance. So, so when the, the brothers that were doing other than themselves, so-called drug dealers, they just unemployed, ignorant, young black youth. That's all they are. They just poorly educated, never got any knowledge of anything. They got cheated out of education in school. They didn't have any job opportunities. The only choice that they really had was to either to join the military or work for the Medellin cartel selling drugs. Mm. Maybe they weren't even smart enough to get in the military or they weren't even in good physical shape to be in the military to go overseas and kill people. So they over here killing people in their own neighborhood. You see? So, so again, they're more victims than anything else. They're not out there selling drugs because they're the ones growing the drugs and producing the drugs and transporting the drugs internationally. No, no, they're just the victims being used by the real perpetrators, you see? So Allah had compassion. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm. So uh, uh, when, when the brother pulled the shotgun, see, the littlest brother, the smallest brother, I think Brother William, he wasn't no more than like five, maybe five, four. Mm. He grabbed the shotgun. Mm. He pulled the shotgun. He pulled the trigger and the gun wouldn't go off. Mm. He did what exactly what he was trained to do, but Allah intervened. Allah yes, sir. He did. Or even hurt. Well, he did have a broken arm. By the time the body slammer got done with him, he did have a broken arm. But he said he was glad he had a broken arm. Mm. See, see, when you get a righteous chastisement like that, you're even glad that, that you got that chastisement because it straightens you out. Because you were probably confused about a little something. And then when you got slammed like that, all of a sudden, you got instant clarity. <laughs> oh. And a lot of those brothers, you see, that were selling drugs out there, they joined the FOI. Mm. A lot of them were strung out on drugs. We set up a drug treatment center. You see, we had a brother um, who was a lawyer. Now, I mentioned last week, we were talking about Minister Linward in New York. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, see, I was there the day that Sister Ava and her two uh, law partners joined the nation. All three of them joined at the same time mm. under Minister Linward, now Brother Kareem. So they came in the nation 
And she was the same then as she is, she always was. Me and me and my law partners, we gonna follow the I mean, she was, she was, she was preaching coming down the aisle to accept her own. She was preaching mm. before she even joined. Mm. You know? But now one of the law partners was uh, Brother Larry. Now Brother Larry used to play pro football for the Houston Oilers. So he was a big, tall, beautiful brother, big, strong, athletic brother, but he was a lawyer. Mm. And unfortunately, during the crack epidemic, Brother Larry got strung out on drugs in New York. Now, this was at the same time that the dope busters. So his wife called me because she heard about the dope busters on the news. And she told me the terrible news about Brother Larry, that he mm. had you know, fallen victim to, to, to crack. So I had my driver go to New I said, okay, tell Brother Larry to uh, be waiting on 125th Street and 5th Avenue. And I have my driver pick him up and bring him to Washington, DC. So that's what we did. We brought him to Washington, DC, put him in the drug treatment program going on at Mayfair Mansion. And then Brother Larry was the one that started writing because he was a lawyer. He started writing, he started doing all the legal work for the mosque. Mm. He wrote up all the corporate papers, all of the agreements, all of the things, you know, that started to make, you know, um, mosque number four, the star of the nation. It was because we had that kind of professionalism only because we helped him in his hour of need. Then once he was straightened out, hey, that law education came into good use. And he helped us uh, to set up businesses, corporations, all kinds of things. So I don't know, I, I was rambling there, but you know, the Dope Busters was a uh, international phenomenon. And it showed what you could do under the authority of uh, Master Farad Muhammad and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, if you followed their examples. Mm, mm. Now, the thing I would say to is that, um, see, my eye was on something a little bit beyond just the drugs, because I looked at it like this. Uh, what's the limit on God? Mm -hmm. If God tells you that your enemy is trying to kill you, and you have the right of self-defense, you're not to be the aggressor, but if he's trying to kill you, you have the right to fight those who are fighting with you. Well, drugs is not the only thing that the enemy is using trying to kill us. Mm. So now, um, there were some brothers down in New Orleans, Mosque number 46. They were um, FOI. Now, I don't know how they ended up in the Navy. But here you got some brothers, some Muslim brothers in the nation Somehow or other, they're in the US Navy on a naval destroyer. And they get the orders that they headed to Iraq. They're gonna be part of the Persian Gulf War. So they said, wait a minute, in Iraq, a Muslim country? Mm. <laughs> and they're Muslims. They said, how in the world we as Muslims, we gonna go to a Muslim country and start killing Muslims? How, how? So you know what they did? They see, they remembered the instructions that was given to the FOI. So they said, if the enemy is trying to attack you with a weapon, and in this case, the weapon was a US naval destroyer, then you're supposed to take it. Mm. So that's what they did. They went and took the destroyer. And they uh, took the ship back to um, New, New Orleans. Mm. See, you know, we don't have a God that's limited to just little dope dealers on the corner. See, some of these wicked people that need to be stopped that are actually fighting us, committing aggressive actions against us, they need to be stopped. Yeah, and we are authorized. As a matter of fact, we are ordered by Allah to fight these people. So I don't know why we stopped fighting. I really mm -hmm. don't, because we were winning. 
So why would you stop fighting when you're winning? I can see it if, if we was losing. Mm. But every battle that we fought, Allah gave us the victory. To the dope busters, we didn't have to really fight the dope boys, but we did have to fight the police. Mm. We found that the real uh, authority behind the drug trade in Washington, D.C., and also organ trafficking, harvesting organs, that was being run by the police department. You see, and so we had so so the real fighting was with the police. Mm. But every time we fought the police, it was not we who backed down; it was the police who backed down. So mm. what I'm trying to say is that the power has always been with us. When we have been morally upright and straight, then we have that moral force and power that is a compelling force a compelling power that cannot be denied or opposed by any other force and power because it is absolutely the power of God. Mm, mm, mm. So if we understand that that works on a small scale, the, on a small scale, we have so many examples that, that that really works like that. So my question is, why don't we try it on a big scale and stop the real killers instead of the little killers? No, the big killers the ones that really need to be stopped. So, and if we don't do it, I mean, I'm talking about the people of God, the people who actually know God. You can't fault these other people who don't even know who God is. That's right, that's right. That's, that, that's why they're scared of the devil, because they don't know God. I would be scared of the devil too, except I know God. And it's not that I'm not scared of the devil, I'm just more scared of God. Yes, sir. I'm scared not to do what God said. So if, if God said, go punch the devil in the nose, okay, go punch him in the nose and see what happens next. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> so anyhow, thank, thank you for that question. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Lehman. People are showing you all across the country. Brother Elijah, his name of praise be to a lot. My brother's keeper. I'm so glad to hear from our brother. People just showing you love. Okay, we have a quick 60 second commercial break. For all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast who like to share, subscribe, as well as every anonymous donation to Cash App to the People's Podcast, we greatly appreciate it. Then we have an exclusive clip that we want to share with Dr. Aline overseas, and he's going to explain to us the backdrop of that uh, story. One second. Okay. A camera and a drone. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book and now Spanish book all three available on amazon.com Sister Naima's Stay on Point Dance Academy LLC she teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country right here in the studios of Atlanta Georgia Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire he'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 Disinfected Cleaning Services, out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in a Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. Thank you all, thank you all very much. Okay, yes sir. Now, Dr. Lee, we, we, the questions are going from the 80s to 90s, they're all over the place, back to Friday 75, but we are gonna thank you for your patience because Dr. Lee knows how to tie it all together. We want, I want, uh, before we went live, I just wanna let people know, Dr. Lee is one of the most humble people I've ever met, you know what I'm saying, virtually, because when I sh shared the clip with him, he was so, he said he never saw the clip, he didn't even know, you know, I just think that's very, uh, we appreciate your humility for someone, uh, like we appreciate that, it's that greatly appreciated. Now we wanna share the clip and hear what was the backdrop to the story of what was taking place of Dr. Uh, overseas, one moment. Okay, here we go. One second, there we go. All right, we are going to, there we go, boom. This is our first time, but we're gonna, we're gonna get it together. We have no facility. 
Yes. And we decided not to leave. Yeah, yeah. The same, the second missile entered by the... Oh, that well, was this is not a way to sustain life. And no meat, he said. You, 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 you it's a slow death yeah. for the whole nation. Not, mm -hmm. not just the little babies, but for the whole population. Uh, and of course, similar sanctions are in effect in other countries around the world. You know, and so this is genocide. That's the only word that describes what is taking place here. But I cannot use my okay, brain for this All right, children. now we want to show. No facility. Yes. Okay, yes, sir. So, Dr. Ali, what, what was the circumstance uh, of that? Well, that was a um, that was a clip from the World Friendship Tour. I believe that was in 1996. And that was uh, shot at the Saddam Hussein uh, Hospital for Children in Baghdad. And they were giving us a tour of the children's hospital, um, which as it wasn't a part of the clip there, but as I said to Minister Farrakhan at a certain point, uh, it became obvious to me that this is not a hospital. Uh, this is a death ward. Because how could it be a hospital if there's no medicine? See, those mm. babies were dying. They were sick. Um, and there was no medicine. It wasn't that the doctors didn't know what to do. They just didn't have any medicine because of United States sanctions against Iraq. And so when you hear about these sanctions against this country, that country, or the other country. Okay, those are the people who suffer, the, the babies, the children, they die. Now, it just came out just last week that uh, that war and the other wars in Syria and Libya and other places, all of those countries we visited with the World Friendship Tour, mm. they've killed more than 4.5 million civilians, not to mm. mention the military deaths, and they're not actually counting those children. See, the Secretary of State at that time was Madeleine Albright. And when the UN and other people came in and they said, well, this is over four, pardon me, there's over 250,000 children in Iraq alone that have died as a result of these sanctions. And her reply was, it was worth it. In other words, to overthrow Saddam Hussein it was worth the lives of 250,000 children. Now, that clip was from when? Probably 1996. Correct, yes sir. Now the depleted uranium, see those babies were dying from cancer. They had leukemias, they had uh, melanomas, they had sarcomas. These are all deadly types of cancer. Almost all of those babies had cancer. Um, most of, not most of them, but a high percentage of them also had uh, congenital deformities, um, malformations of all types. Um, there were many stillbirths and miscarriages because the United States and NATO, England, Germany, France, they had invaded Iraq and they were using illegal weapons made out of depleted uranium. Now depleted uranium is used because, now that's the, re, that's depleted uranium. That sounds like it's safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it's, it's highly radioactive. It's depleted, meaning that um, that's kind of like the leftover byproduct from nuclear power plants and nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. So if you say, you know, the, when they purify the uranium to make a, new, uh, a, a bomb or for a nuclear power plant, what about, the residue, well, that's the depleted uranium. And uranium is a metal. And it's one of the hardest metals known. It's harder than steel. Mm. So if you make an artillery shell coated with depleted uranium, that's an armor piercing shell. But now when it pierces the armor, the friction creates so much heat that it vaporizes the uranium and puts it into the atmosphere and people breathe it. And when they breathe it in, it causes cancer. Mm. Now, what's the half-life? See, radioactive elements have a half-life. 
over time, they, 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 you know, they wear down. What's the half-life of depleted uranium? 4.5 billion years. 4.5 billion years. And then what that really means is half of the amount that they shot up over, over there will still be there. They would just be reduced by half. Mm. And it'll take another 4.5 billion years to be reduced by another half and another half. So in other words, they have ruined that part of the world forever. Mm. Now, uh, to bring it up to date, depleted uranium is now being used in Ukraine. And the, um, the, um, the Russians bombed an uh, ammo depot where this depleted uranium was being stored and it created a mushroom cloud that many people saw on the news. Mm. Well, that depleted uranium doesn't stay in Ukraine. So it's spreading all over Europe. And, and, and I would expect by now, it's probably circling the globe. You see, so, so the deadly things that were going on, killing babies in the Saddam Hussein uh, hospital for children, that's the same thing that's going on in Ukraine. That's the same thing that's going to be going on everywhere until the killer is stopped. Stop the killing. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent, Dr. Ali. And people are saying, wow, this is truth. All for it's a lot. People are just showing you love all across the country. Thank you all for your positive energy and comments. Um, Dr. Ali, I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you for that breakdown of how it's relevant to to today one of the comments that we got on youtube was to, that you that you had a very uh, you broke down your experience in a in, about the slave dungeons your visit to the slave dungeons when you came to uh just somebody said that you spoke about that your visit to the slave dungeons when you came back from africa yes sir could you let us know what that was like visiting the slave dungeons oh yeah i forgot about that yeah um at elmina at the elmina castle mm. in ghana um, and I can't remember what year it was the first time I went there. I've been there more than once, but it was a very moving experience, a very moving experience because um, the Elmina Castle's right there on the coast. So they used to collect the, the slaves from the interior and bring them to the castle, which was basically like a slave dungeon. And up top uh, is where uh, the, the Europeans housed themselves and then down below was literally like going into a dungeon in hell. Um, and when you walk down this, this pathway to where they kept the, the slaves chained in this big uh, underground chamber, um, it, at first I thought I was walking on asphalt, you know, black asphalt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I was surprised. I said, well, how did this asphalt get here? And the guy had said, that's not asphalt. I said, what is it? He said, that's human excrement that has just solidified uh, into like stone. But it's, it's the human excrement from the slaves that were kept in the Elmina castle. Yes, sir. So anyhow, to, and then they had a, they had a stairway or, or, or like a trap door so they could come down into the dungeon and grab any of the women, or I guess the men too, that they wanted for sexual purposes. And they could pull them up, you know, into the upper chamber. And then when they were done with them, then drop them back down into hell. So then there's a passageway that goes down to the sea uh, where they would uh, put them on boats and take them out to the slave ship. And that was called the, 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 the door of, or the gate of no return. The gate of no return. And it had the Star of David on it. The gate of no return. And when you're standing there and you're feeling, you can feel the spirit of the thousands upon thousands and thousands of people over so many years that were crowded into that space, you can feel their spirits. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's, it's disturbing. It's not a pleasant experience. 
you know, but then you, you get acquainted with the reality of that because that's you standing there just like they were standing there. But then, you know what happened? I had an epiphany. I said, they call this the door or the gate of no return. But guess what? Here I am. <laughs> you call it what you want. <laughs> but here I am. Uh, here we are. Yes, sir. We're yes, sir. We back home again. Yes, sir. You see? So you can't hold us down. But don't but don't but, but make no mistake about it. That everybody uh should go there, Elmina. And then there's a place in Senegal called Gory Island. And there's other places too. But I, I, I would say each and every one of us, we owe it to ourselves. We owe it to our children. We owe it to our ancestors to visit those places and see what happened and what it was really like. Instead of these, you know, they give us fantasy movies about Africa. You know, that Black Panther movie? Yes, sir, yes, sir. They made up a country called uh, Wakanda. Just like Africa doesn't have real countries. Mm. Just like we don't have real kingdoms. They don't make up a kingdom and give it to us and say, hey, this is your heritage. No, no, we need to go and see the real thing, get acquainted with the with the with the real reality. Oh, friends, this is like, yes, sir, Dr. Lamy, you continue to teach, and people are saying they bear witness all across the country. Okay, yes, sir. Well, I also wanted to talk about. We were going to schedule this interview because we had some questions that it's some exclusive information that Dr. Aleem shared with me off on the phone for the 4th of July. Um, but then after our conversation, I was like, no, let's have it right away. But I really wanted to talk about the importance of Master Farah Muhammad making himself known and why why is that relevant in 2023? Could you help us understand that? Yeah, that's very relevant, not just for us and our salvation as individuals and collectively, but the appearance of Master Farad Muhammad in Detroit in, on July the 4th, 1930 uh, is important for the whole world, uh, especially for the world of Islam. See, what most Muslims have never thought about or considered is the fact that we don't have a Khalifa. Mm, mm. See, the Catholics have a Pope. You see, the Orthodox Christians, they have a patriarch. The Buddhists, they got somebody. See, the Hindus got somebody. They got a top guy. See, the Anglicans, they got a top guy. You see, but who do the Muslims have? Mm -hmm. We don't have a Khalifa. See, after the death of Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salam, the Muslims were guided by the rightly guided Khalifs. And then trouble started, but we always had a caliph. And even though some of them by historical accounts were not necessarily rightly guided, but, but regardless of that, at least we had a caliph, just like you can't say all the popes were righteous. Mm. You know, I mean, we can't expect perfection all the time from everybody. You see, but in 19, um, I might be off on the date, but somewhere around 1917 to 1924, the British forced the Ottoman Sultan, who was the Caliph, to abdicate the Caliphate, mm. which was the same thing as decapitating the Islamic world. So here's the Islamic world that was the rival to the British Empire, the rival to the Russian Empire, rival to the Hungarian Austrian Empire, a force in the world for centuries. The Muslim Empire occupied large parts of Europe for 700 years. Mm, mm, mm. We gave Europe Europe's Renaissance and lifted them up out of the dark ages. That's right, that's right. You see, but a hundred years ago, they decapitated Islam. In 1917, 
the British General Allenby crossed the Jordan River and declared an end to the Christian Crusades mm. to conquer the Holy Land. And this was the time that Lord Balfour wrote a letter to Lord Rothschild promising the support of the British Empire to relocate the Jews into uh, the Holy Land. Mm. See, people don't remember uh, the history too well of the Jewish people. Why did they have to be relocated back into the Holy Land? Well, it was because they got run out the first time. That's right, that's right. They got run out uh, by the Babylonians and taken into captivity. And then Allah allowed them to come back into the Holy Land and rebuild the temple. And they acted so terrible uh, that the Romans had to come in and run them out. Mm. And this time Allah told the Jews, you ain't coming back no more. Unless, unless you, you be a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to have no kingdom. Like, you know, to see another way, talking about we're going to reestablish uh, the kingdom of David and Solomon, build, rebuild the temple in the third, you know, talking about the third temple. But what happened to the first two? Mm. How come you go to the first two? Now you don't mind the third one. Well, but they had the support of the British, you see. And then they found all the diamonds down there in South Africa. And so now they had the military support of the British Empire. They had the financial support from the Kimberley diamond mines in South Africa. And then they used that wealth and military power, you see, to come back into the Holy Land by 1949. But along the way, you see, you, you could easily ask the question, well, if they destroyed the Muslim caliphate, why didn't some other Muslim stand up and declare himself to be the caliph? See, in, in the last 100 years, the nation of Islam in the broad sense, not the nation of, not the lost found nation of Islam. Yes, sir, yes, sir. The nation of Islam in the large sense has not had any leadership. So no wonder you see the wreckage of the Muslim world. Is being devastated. That clip that you showed from Baghdad, that's a part of the devastation of the Muslim world in fulfillment mm. of the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salam, that he saw uh, what was called woe to the Arabs. Woe to the Arabs. That was going to, that, that what was going to be coming upon them in these last days. Mm. Well, now to make a very long detailed story short, and, and, and if people want to get a historical account of it, it there's a very good motion picture called uh, Lawrence of Arabia. Yes, sir. Like a three hour movie, but it's historically very accurate and it shows how the British Empire conquered Islam. Not only had they invented a new form of Islam called Wahhabism 200 years before, but now through military might, and uh, deception, they were now in control of, the, of Mecca and Medina. And it was the British agent, John Philby, in 1931, who installed the, the Saudi so-called king. Now, every Muslim knows that Al Malik is not Ibn Saud in Saudi Arabia. Mm. Al Malik is Allah himself. And today he reigns in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, not Ibn Saud or King Abdullah or any other king. There's no such thing as a king in Islam other than mm. Allah. So the British set that up. So what I'm trying to say to us is that we should look at Master Farad Muhammad in a different light. And that will cast a different light on us. He was a refugee. The British had conquered the Holy Land. They conquered Mecca and Medina, and they control it to this day through uh, crypto Muslims that are not real Muslims, but they're British agents. And they are uh, like holding down 
the holy places so the real holy people can't get to them. And so Master Farad Muhammad escaped the, uh, the collapse of Islam, the collapse of Mecca. Go read the history of how uh, the, the Muslims fought to defend Mecca and Medina against the British and how they were slaughtered uh, to, the every, to the last man. Go read about the treachery of uh, uh, the hypocritical Muslims uh, who were to keep the holy shrines and how they sold out for British bribery money. They paid them $7 million in British sterling. You know, I'm, I can't go into the details of it, but in other words, they conquered Islam. And Master Farad Muhammad was a refugee who came to the wilderness of North America to preserve Islam in its original form because it had been corrupted over there. Wahhabism is British Islam. They like to portray it like this is Orthodox Islam. No, it's not. Mm. That's the Islam that was developed by the British colonial office 250 years ago. Mm. And if you want to read the details of it, read the book, The Confessions of the British Spy. Um, it's online. So Master Farad Muhammad was a refugee. You could think of him like the Ark of the Covenant. In his person, he contained the entire history of Islam from the very beginning with God. Mm, mm, mm. He had memorized the entire history of the nation of Islam going back 250,000 years. And the part that he had not memorized by heart, it was said that he would go into uh, the dream history where he was just going to some kind of a trance state and he would go back into the part of the history that was needed at the time to illustrate some point. So he escaped from the fall of old, the old world of Islam. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. And he brought the new Islam to the wilderness of North America and taught it to a dead people. Why did he teach it to a dead people instead of a living people? Because if he had taught it to a living people, uh, first of all, they would have rejected it because they would have thought they already had something. Mm, mm, mm. But he taught it to a people who knew they didn't have nothing. He taught it to a people who were dead that nobody else could teach. And then he brought out of a dead people the greatest man that has ever walked the, 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 the soil of North America. A man so great and so powerful that here we are, all these many years later, we're still talking about Elijah Muhammad. And Elijah Muhammad was only the student. I remember when the first time they showed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad on television in 1972. And that was the closest look that we had ever seen. I mean, when you went to save his day, he was there way, off, way in the distance on a stage. But to see him up close on television, I mean, we were in the FOI house. We were going crazy. That's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, man. That's the lamb. That's the lamb of God. And then somebody said, no, man, that is God. Mm. That is God. And that, they all agreed. And they asked me, they said, well, Brother Maurice, that's what I was called at that time. What do you say? Do you think he's God? I said, well, he sure looks like God. I said, but the only reason I don't think he's God is because he told us of another one. Mm. That's the only reason I, I wouldn't call him God because he told us about another one who is God. But if it wasn't for that other one that he told us about, yeah, I would, I would mistake him for God. <laughs> yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. See, so, what, so let me just wind that point up because it's very, very important that is, it's a very, very important point. It's the crucial point. It's the only point. How do you think that Islam is going to make progress into the future unless there's a people who are bold enough to take it into the future? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's not them old dusty old people uh, over, over there in the old world of Islam. They're not going into no future of Islam. That's the past of Islam. And as you can see, that old Islam was not good enough to keep them from falling into slavery. 
So we need a new Islam that's stronger than that Islam. And so now we know how to do that. See, that's what Master Farad Muhammad came. He came not with an old Islam. He came with a new Islam. That's what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said. This is a new Islam. It's different from the old Islam. Yes, it's based on the same five basic principles of belief and the five basic principles of action, but it's new and brand new and it's different. And you know what else he said? He said it's for black Muslims only. Mm, mm. See, so now, I don't think he was calling talking about color because he wasn't black in color himself. I think he's talking about black, like see black is, is refers to the original. See, it's for the original Muslims only. Mm, mm, he didn't mm. call us Sunni. When did people get to be called Sunni? When did people get to be called Shia and Hanafi and Salafi and all these other Su uh, um, uh, Sufis? When did they get to be called all of these designations, got these titles and tags? No, no, that's a, that's a recent development. That, that's a recent development. That's a recent corruption of Islam. Islam in its original form didn't know nothing about Sunni and Shia and Hanafi and all that stuff, Wahhabi. That's right. No, as, as a matter of fact, you, you weren't even called a Muslim. You were just a Muslim. Mm. See, you were just, you, you weren't even called that. And your way of life wasn't even called Islam. The word Islam and the word Muslim had to be invented as a clean glass to sit down beside these dirty religions that are just part of this wicked world in the last 6,000 years. All of them, you know, trace their roots back to uh, Nimrod in Babylon, where if you recall, Nimrod claimed he was God. Mm -hmm, you see, mm -hmm. and brought all the people under that kind of a foolish uh, system of religion that has been practiced down to the present day in various forms. And so Master Farad Muhammad is coming, uh, not just combating, you know, the present situation of black folks in America. No, no, no. He's, he's combating an entire wicked civilization uh, that's 6,000 years old. Mm. And more than that, He's completing the work of the original creator God mm. who desired to be perfect, but he did not achieve perfection. And so down through the trillions of years, all of the gods of Islam, as we could say now, all of them have striven for perfection, but all have fallen short until the one that we have now. See, the great God that we have now, Master Farad Muhammad. See, he's, he's one with the original creator God in terms of his intention and his desire. So Allah desired that he be known. Therefore, he created man. Mm. So in man, you have the manifestation of divine. Everything that you say that God is can only be found in man. Mm, mm, mm. You see, and so uh, Master Farad Muhammad in his person represents the perfection of all of the divine attributes that in the past people only was, you know, scratched their heads about and were perplexed about and, philo and then they were philosophical about it. But when you see these attributes, in their fullness to their perfected degree walking around on two feet yes sir yes sir in the world with you looking you in your face talking to you in your ear interfering with your usual way of life as a matter of fact promising to collapse your entire civilization and replace it with one of his own that's right. That's right. And then see, the good thing about it is that this great God who came with that kind of idea of an unlimited future of perfected wisdom, of unlimited progress, 
he invited us to go along with him. <laughs> That's the best part. He wasn't so friendly uh, to some of these other people. See, now that's what people in the nation of Islam should be aware of. Don't, don't, don't you realize that the rest of the world is jealous of you? Mm. When you tell them that God came in person to visit you, mm, mm, mm. they're jealous, man. They're jealous as hell. How come, how come he didn't come to see us? Because you wasn't good enough. Mm. That's why. God knows who to, who to put his message with. And see, that's why we should be glad that we're Negroes. Mm. See, Negro, what does Negro mean? Everybody knows that that goes to the mosque. Negro comes from the Greek word necros, that's right? right? That's and necros right. is dead, right? So we should be glad that we're dead. We should be glad that we're Negroes. See, I'm glad I, I'm dead. See, because if you're not dead, then you can't be resurrected. See, all these people so proud that they're not dead like Negroes. <laughs> what you so proud for? <laughs> you, 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 you should be envious of us. You should be as dead as us, because if you were as dead as we are, then God might have been attracted to you. Mm. But since you wasn't dead, then God wasn't attracted to you. God was attracted to us. So that's why he came and knocked on our door and didn't, didn't knock on your door. So don't come here telling us uh, all about God because you never met him in person. You don't know nothing about God. You just heard about God. God came uh, himself and told us about himself. That's right. So we're That's not right. in a mystery about who God is and what God is like and what God wants to do. You see, so uh, with all due respect to everybody else, you just need to sit down and shut up. So that's the significance. See, there's a new world of Islam that is free of defects. See, the old Islam had defects in it. So now this new Islam and the new Muslims who belong to the new Islam, and that's not everybody. You see, it would be free of defects. Now, the, now, final thing, Master Farad Muhammad, on his departure, he told the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said, now, uh, you teach them what I taught you, but don't beg any of them to believe. If none of them believe, then on my return, the two of us will go together to build the hereafter. Well, yes, sir. That's what he said. See, see now, well, I'm saying that because a lot of times people see they get they get things twisted. They get things twisted. They think just because you're black that you're guaranteed a place in the hereafter. No, you're mm. not. Mm. What did Master Farad Muhammad said? He said, if none of them believe, he held out the possibility that none of us would really believe. He didn't say that we wouldn't say we believe. Yeah, a whole bunch said they already believe. He gave out. Uh, 10,000 holy names. He, ta he taught 25,000 Negroes in the city of Detroit, gave out 10,000 holy names. Mm, mm, mm. So they all said they believe. But he said, on my if, if none of them return, and pardon me, if none of them believe on my return. See, so in other words, he was predicting kind of indirectly that there were going to be all kinds of things that would be happening from the time of his departure from among us to the time of his return. And that it was a possibility that out of all of these so-called Negroes that he came to save, that none of them would believe. Mm, mm, mm. All of them would go down with the devil. Now, of course, that's looking on the gloomy side. See, because some of us, we do believe, don't we? That's right. We, we do believe in Allah who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad. There's some of us that did not go for the okie doke. See, that's why I can't understand all this interest that people have in Malcolm. Why, why are you so interested in somebody that dropped out of the classroom of divine? Why don't you pay attention to people that stayed in the classroom? Mm, see mm, what happened mm. to them. You see what happens to you when you drop out of the classroom of divine. Nothing good. Now you can go into the details of how that tragedy went down. 
But the main thing is that you should have learned from history is you should have stayed in the classroom of divine where you belong. Mm. So that's that's what I have to say about Master Farad Muhammad. He's the savior, not just of you and me. See, a lot of times we, we, we think about Jesus on the cross being the savior. See, we got that Bible narrative. We got that imagery in our head. We think about somebody hanging on the cross, bleeding all over everybody. That, that ain't no savior. That's a dead man on the cross. Mm, mm. But, but he's our personal savior. That's right. You know, individually. He's our savior as a nation of people. But he's also the savior of Islam mm. in general for everybody. Because where would the world be without Islam? I'm talking about the mathematical Islam. See, without the mathematical Islam, the world would stop turning. Mm, mm, the sun mm. would go out. <laughs> the stars would fall down. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of being out, out, being out, 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 allegorical here, but still, you get my point. Absolutely. See, see, this is the engine of the universe. Islam is what runs the universe. Yes, sir. The nation of Islam is run by 24 scientists. Come on, they come on. They control the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the weather. They control everything. So now, if the devil was successful in destroying Islam, then what would that mean? Mm. So Master Farad Muhammad is not just your and my savior. Uh, he saved me from drugs. Or he saved me from this, that. Or, yeah, 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 all that's true. But that's small time stuff. No, this is the great God of the universe that is here to save Islam itself, a system of life that has now been perfected. So that's, that's what I got to say about that. <laughs> Excellent teaching, Dr. Layman. People are showing you love all across the country. That's right. All right, everybody's showing you love. Thank you everyone who's saying that's part. Well, I was like, beautiful, yes sir. Thank you very much. Take it or leave it and, and teach. And just thank everyone who was watching. Okay, and we're gonna come back. Some people have Malcolm X questions and about, we will come back to that, but I wanna start with the Black Panther uh, party. You told me a story. I wanna make sure we have that on top, how you uh, went to visit them and what, what transpired, sir. Oh yeah, well, of course the Black Panther uh, party story is the Malcolm X story. Yeah, it's all the same thing. Mm, mm. So I think last uh, week I talked about how my life was shattered when they killed Dr. King shot him down like a dog. And I had been a follower of Dr. King and that was my man, you know, and then he'd gone just like that. So I'm searching for something, you know, to dedicate my life to. And at the time, you know, all the hype was around the Panthers and the Nation of Islam and the US organization and SNCC. I was already a member of SNCC, mm -hmm. the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee but they really weren't doing all that much. I was already a member of the Berkeley Anti-Draft Union in mm. California. Mm. You know? So I was already affiliated with, but none of them were satisfying and none of them replaced Dr. King in my life. So long story short, I made a trip out to Oakland to the Panther headquarters. I wanted to check them out, see if this was where I belong. Yes, sir. And, uh, they wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't let, let me in the building. Uh, they said they didn't know who I was. I might be a security risk, and they couldn't let me on the premises. And I'm dressed up in my dashiki, got my afro, and got my tiki doll around my, you know, and they wouldn't let me in. Mm -hmm. But now they didn't have to let me in because they had this, it was a really nice modern building that they had. I mean, I was really impressed. You know, it was a nice piece of real estate. And they had these plate glass doors on the front and you could see into the building mm. and there i saw the black panthers in their black leather jackets and black tams sitting behind desks with white women mm. and i'm saying what and so i didn't need to go in because mm. one look was enough to see that the panther party was not what it was cracked up to be mm. now what's the malcolm connection with the black panther party See now, um, back in those days, you know, there was a common question that would come up. People would say, what about Malcolm? And we would say, what about Malcolm? 
Because really, see, Malcolm was not the topic of any discussion. Mm. You know, people, people are more conscious of Malcolm today in 2023 than they were in 1968 or 69. Mm. When nobody talking about Malcolm, you know, uh, certainly in the Nation of Islam, uh, Malcolm was not the topic of anybody's discussion, pro or con. He just, he, he just didn't come up. There was nothing to talk about. What was there to talk about? Everything that Malcolm did, he did under the auspices of the Nation of Islam. Mm. And when he left, left the Nation of Islam, he didn't do nothing. Mm. So what was there to talk about? He didn't do nothing but get killed. He didn't leave nothing behind. You see, and, and the, then the lessons answer that situation very clearly. It asks it has the question, um, why, why do our people love the devil? Mm. Why do our people love the devil? Because the devil gives them what? Nothing. Nothing. Okay, so what's Malcolm outside the nation? Nothing. He mm. didn't build nothing. He didn't leave nothing. He didn't do nothing. So why do the people love him? Because the devil gave them nothing. Mm. You see, he didn't do nothing. So back to the Panther Party now. See, the people who manipulated and eventually killed Malcolm, what they were trying to do was create um, a, a martyr for the Marxist, Leninist, Black nationalist community. In other words, Malcolm became the Jesus of the Black nationalists. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, he was the Jesus of the black nationalists who claimed they didn't believe in God. But all these so-called black nationalists who claimed to be Marxist, Leninist, communists, they had all been raised in the church. Mm. So they just used Malcolm as like a black nationalist Jesus that got crucified. You see, and so then the Black Panther Party was headed by Huey P. Newton. Well, according to the theology of the Black Panther Party, who was Malcolm? Malcolm was the crucified Jesus. Mm. Who was Hugh, Huey P. Newton? Huey P. Newton was the Apostle Paul. Mm. See, see, Malcolm, like, let's like, see, Jesus didn't found the church, did he? No, sir. No, sir. No, it was the Apostle Paul. <laughs> okay, and Peter and the rest of them, right? So that's who Huey P. Newton claimed he was. He was the Apostle Paul of Malcolm X. Mm. Now, since Malcolm X didn't have a program of his own, if you look on the back of the Black Panther Party paper, it's almost a carbon copy uh, of the Muslim program, what the Muslims want and what the Muslims uh, uh, believe. Uh, be, 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 believe. They just put it in Marxist Leninist terms. So essentially the Black Panther Party was an alternative black nationalist religious movement to counter the nation of Islam. Mm. How, how do I know? Because they used to try to run us off the corner. We selling Muhammad speaks on the corner, all of a sudden here's somebody show up in a black tam in a in a leather, a black leather jacket. And you got a Black Panther newspaper, and you think you're gonna run the FOI off the corner? Oh my goodness! Just because you you say you got weapons, and you know we don't. Well, who stayed on the corner? That I'll just leave it like that. In the end, who was left on the corner selling papers? Who ended up selling a million copies of newspapers every week, making oh. Muhammad speaks not just the biggest Black newspaper. Muhammad Speaks was the biggest newspaper, period, black mm. or white. Mm. Nobody had a bigger sales distribution than Muhammad Speaks. But the Black Panthers, you see, uh, they were um, like a, like a quasi-religious movement. Mm. And they tried to duplicate everything that the Nation of Islam was doing without giving credit to God. That's all that was. Mm. And then you have these silly people see see then they make movies and and then you got silly people nowadays they go trying to resurrect that what are you trying to re you don't even know what you're doing mm. you just watched the movie you just saw some tv shows and they told you something about the black panthers and you don't know nothing about those people and what they were really like they weren't like what you think mm. 
That's why the Honorable Elijah, Elijah Muhammad got on the minister for uh, bowing to Huey P. Newton. Who are you bowing to? No, we have to get the history straight. See, because look, look at these young brothers now running around here calling themselves Black Panthers. Then they even made a movie called The Black Panther. Yeah, well, what are they, they, what, they're repeating the tragic historical mistakes because mm. they don't know the history. They, the mo most of what they think is just made up stuff in their head. They don't even know what really happened. They, they would, and they won't even talk to people who were really there. Mm. They go by what was on the news <laughs> and what was in, 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 in the movies. And then they give you a Black Panther movie star that dies a year after the movie comes out. Now, what kind of hero is that? Mm. Heroes ain't supposed to die like that. That's right. And he died of colon cancer. Now, how do you get colon cancer like that? I'm a doctor. I know how you get it. I'm not going to mention it on a family program like this. But he shouldn't have been doing that kind of stuff. Mm. Then they give you that as a Black Panther. Now, what we used to say in the nation back then, you see now in any civilized society, suppose you really did live in a civilized society and there was a Black Panther out there in the street threatening people. <laughs> what, 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 what would you do to a Black Panther out there in the street growling and snarling at people? What would you mm. do if you were in a civilized society? Mm. You would put it down. That's right. So now why would somebody in their right mind call themselves after a Black Panther, knowing that as soon as a civilized man finds out that there's a Black Panther prowling around, threatening people, uh, that you're gonna be put down? It would be better to identify yourself instead of identifying yourself as some kind of a beast. I mean, why would, why would a civilized man take on the identity of a beast, call himself after a beast? I'm a panther. I mean, that's, that's, that's just so uncivilized. Why don't you call yourself a civilized man mm. and, and take on the characteristics of a civilized man instead of a wild, savage beast? And, and why would you think that your people are so foolish that they would follow you uh, in the character of a wild, savage, Black Panther beast? No, no, our people want to follow something that's clean and civilized. Yes, and sir, yes, sir. Uplifting. You see, wisdom doesn't look like a Black Panther. Mm. Excellent. Okay, I think you powerful teaching and powerful history and people show you love all across the country. Thank you very much. People saying, teach Muhammad, go ahead. Um, thank you all, praise the Lord. Just thank you everybody who's bearing witness to Dr. Alain. We can't wait to put this on YouTube. Okay, now Dr. Dr. I'm telling y'all, this is people's podcast. <laughs> Dr. Alain, we feel at home and comfortable with this conversation, but I want people to know Dr. Alim is, of course, as you are, I know he's very brilliant. He gave us some great talking points, uh, gave me some talking points I'm about to ask him. So I just thank you all for staying tuned with us. Continue to <laughs> like, share, subscribe, and the People's Podcast Cash App. We appreciate that as well. I wanted to ask you, sir, about the book, The History of the World, as well as The Rising Tide of Color, and what is their significance? Uh, you you named those two books, and like why, is that, why are those two books significant? Okay, those were... Um... The Rising Tide of Color, written by Lothrop Stoddard, and The History of the World by H.G. Wells. Those were two of the books given by Master Farad Muhammad to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for him to read. Mm, mm, mm. So there was a total of 104 books. Uh, most of the titles have never been, at least to my knowledge, revealed. Uh, but those were the two titles that were revealed uh, at that when I came in the nation and, and we read those books. Mm. See? And then the other book um, was a biography. It was called Muhammad. It was a biography written by um, um, Washington Irving, the same author that wrote the, uh, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He was actually a religious scholar. Mm. And uh, according to some religious scholars, uh, he wrote one of the best biographies of Prophet Muhammad. And so that was also one of the books. So um, yeah, Lothrop Stoddard uh, wrote The Rising Tide of Color. 
Uh, and he was basically warning the Western world uh, about the rise of China and Japan and Africa, and the Arab world, you know, and, and basically preparing the white race uh, for what was going to be, come upon them in the 20th century. Mm. He was talking about a book that was written more than a hundred years ago. And so if you look at the events that did occur over the course of the 20th century and now into the 21st century, we see that Lothrop Stoddard's book uh, was a wise warning uh, because the rising tide of color has now reached a peak. And you, you've seen you know, the erasure, the literal extinction of a white Western civilization is just disappearing mm. and it's being replaced uh, by, um, a, well, I'll just say a non-white civilization. Mm. So basically, um, you're, a, you're a historian um, and I referred another book to you um, written by um, Carol Quigley. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Tragedy and Hope. Now, one of the things that we should always keep in mind if we look at history of uh, 500 years ago, the world wasn't like it is now. Mm. If you went back 500 years ago, um, the people in Europe had just barely broken out of Europe. See, Christopher Columbus, the half original man, he was no right. white man. He was half original, like Barack Obama. That's right. Like many of us. He was half original man. He wasn't no white man discovering nothing. He was a half original man leading the Europeans out of Europe to show them, hey, there's something over there that you need to check out. So give the half original man the credit. Don't give the white man the credit. The half original man did that. So 500 years ago, the Europeans had barely broken out of Europe. You see, if you read in Revelations, it says that there was a strong angel uh, that had the key to the pit of hell. And he locked the devil up in hell for a thousand years. Mm, mm, mm. Well, that's Prophet Muhammad, alayhi salam. Wow. He locked the devil up in Europe for a thousand years and they couldn't break out of Europe for a thousand years until mm -hmm. a half original man Columbus led them out. They had been locked up for a thousand years by Islam. Well, 500 years ago, if you went to Africa, the emperor of Mali, see that's where Mansa Musa, yes, sir. Came from. this man had so much money you know, he caused inflation all over the all over Africa, all over the Islamic world. Mm. They said Mansa Musa, if you compared him to modern days, this man had more money than Bill Gates. Mm. See, so these were rich people. See, we always think about black people being poor. Not 500 years ago, you wasn't poor. You poor now, because you've been in the hands of a devil for 400 years. You see, but back then, 500 years ago, you weren't poor. When I was in Nigeria with the minister and they did the Durbar with the with the horses and the men, you know, with the spears yes, and yes, sir, yes, sir, and yes, sir. robes on. So they used to teach that in the mob that we used to wear robes of silk and uh, woven with gold and silver. I saw that with my own eyes. Mm. I asked the man, I said that those pants that man has on, they look like solid gold. He said it is gold. It's woven gold. And these, these are heirlooms that have been passed down through families for hundreds of years, you see? So that's how we used to live 500 years ago. Same thing with the Chinese. See, if you go back 500 years ago, see, you, you're at the time of the Ming Dynasty in China. Well, the Ming Dynasty had a fleet of ships. They had something like 3,000 ships in their, in their fleet, in their Navy. Mm. Now, the admiral of the of Chinese fleet, his name was um, Shamsuddin. He was a Muslim. Mm. And um, he made three voyages um, with the uh, Chinese fleet. And these were what they called treasure ships. 
And these were huge ships. See, the 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 what was they called? The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Santa Maria, Columbia. yes, sir. See that those ships. If you ever saw a, a life-size model of those three ships that Columbus had, and he only had three, um, they were about the size of a school bus. Mm. That's about the size of them. They're about the size of a school bus. Meanwhile, the Chinese they had what they called treasure ships. And these, these ships were like almost as big as aircraft carriers that we have today. Mm. And they had thousands of them. So the Chinese Navy headed by the Muslim Admiral, his Chinese name was, uh, I can't say it right, Huang Ze, but his Muslim name was Sham Sadin. And so he sailed the Chinese Navy uh, to Saudi Arabia so he could perform Hajj. Mm. See, there's thousands and thousands, millions of Chinese Muslims. You see, so, and then the other thing he did, he sailed uh, across the Pacific and landed on the coast of what we now call Chile. Mm. So that was in 1432. Now, the in Mali, in Africa, the Emperor Abu Bakr, he, the second, I believe, he sailed across the Atlantic and he landed in what they now call Brazil, mm. in what they call Bahia province. And if you go to Bahia province in Brazil, they say, where all these black people come from? They came from Mali. They sailed mm. across the ocean because Mali had a fleet. China had a fleet. Europe was just beginning to have a fleet. But guess what? In Mali, uh, the fleet never returned from Brazil mm -hmm. and the assumption was made that they fell off <laughs> the, the, the edge of the earth or something terrible happened. Mm -hmm. And so the successor to the emperor, uh, who was his brother, he decided that uh, ocean exploration was a bad idea. Mm -hmm. and so he burned the fleet. The, when, when Shamsuddin, the Chinese admiral, when he returned to the emperor of China and made his report, he said, there's nothing out there but barbarians. Mm. Mm. There's nothing, he, they, they went to trade. See, they had these big treasure ships full of silk, all these precious goods from China. And they, they went to places like Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. And, and these were little primitive places. They didn't have anything to trade. Mm. So the Chinese said, well, uh, I guess we're surrounded by a world full of barbarians. And they mm. burned their fleet. They burned the Chinese fleet 500 mm. years ago. So now if the Africans had not burned their fleet, if the Chinese had not burned their fleet, then the Europeans would have had competition on the high seas. But we did burn our fleet. The mm. Chinese did burn their fleet. Mm. So the Europeans had no competition on the high seas. And that's what allowed them to sail uh, into Africa and pick us up, make us a promise that we would earn more gold for our labor than we could get among our own people and brought us over here to the land that uh, Christopher Columbus led them to. That's right. Now, final point, brother. Um, See, we, we talked about El Mina slave ca castle and the other ones, the slave trade. And all of this is based on a promise that God made to Abraham. The yes, father. sir. Yes, see, sir. That the seed of Abraham would be afflicted for 400 years. That's right. and then after that time, uh, God said to Abraham, who was the friend of Abraham, he said, I will come and deliver them with great substance. Mm. Well, now, you see, now that doesn't mean that the promise that was made to Abraham's seed applies to everybody that was on a slave ship. Mm. See, everybody in Africa is not Abraham's seed. Mm. See, who's Abraham's seed? So that's why you see among us, even among black people, not just among white people and other races of people, you see people who um, they fit the description that Jesus put on the Jews in the Bible, where they claimed that they were the seed of Abraham, 
Abraham was our father. And he That's told right. him, if Abraham was your father, you would love me. That's right. That's right. See, so when we run into people who don't love us, see, when we run into people who don't love this message, when we run into people who don't love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, don't love Minister Farrakhan, we run into people who don't love righteousness. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't love a peaceful way of life. They don't like a civilized way of life. Mm. You see, well, you're running into someone who is not of Abraham's seed. And we can't be racist about it. God's promise to Abraham wasn't, oh, I'm going to save all the black people. No, it was to Abraham's seed. And that means that that is a righteous person. That is a righteous Muslim. They were first called Muslims in Abraham's day. Mm, mm. So that's how you can tell Abraham's seed. These are the righteous people. They are peaceful by nature. Now, they might not have known that they were Muslims. They might not have known uh, they, that they were Abraham's seed. But, it's, but what does the book say? My sheep know my voice. That's right. That's right. So when Abraham's seed heard the message of the God who came in fulfillment of the promise of God that he would deliver us, the minute you heard the word, even without explanation, you understood and believed. See, that's Abraham's seed. Now, somebody that you got, you got to explain this and argue back and forth, and you know what about this? And what, got all kinds of doubts. And hey, okay, 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 I understand that, but uh, that just tells you one thing: it's not for everybody. Mm. That's why he said, "Accept it." or reject it. Mm. Well, why would you reject what's, what's for you? No, you only reject that which is not for you. If you eat something, if you eat some food and that food is not for you, it's not good for you, what, what do you do? You upchuck it, don't you? That's right, that's right. That's, but that's right. how some people are with the teachings. So you're giving them the pure teachings and they don't like it. You say, but it's good. It's true. It's from God in person. They don't care. They upchuck it. You see, so that's what we have to be aware of. Powerful. Yes, sir, Dr. Levin. Thank you very much. We have a few more questions for you. People are showing love all across the country saying, oh, my goodness. Yes, teach. This is what I've been looking for. Wonderful. Praise be to Allah. Excellent show. Thank you all for to everyone who continues to watch on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. Once again, shout out to all the YouTube watchers as well, viewers as well. I wanted to ask you, sir, about, uh, um, especially in Atlanta, there was a brother uh, who, me and him went to a, a men's only program uh, to drill. And we were doing this program and he, and he shared his testimony that when they were coming to give blood at his high school, that they, uh, for the blood banks, they had to stop because there were that many STDs and cases of AIDS in high school in Atlanta, Georgia, that they couldn't even accept the rest of the blood. And it made me think about you and the work that you had done and are doing treatment of, of AIDS and, you know, for- Now that's also reminds me of Mother Clara Muhammad in the Nation of Islam. See, because who was it that filled the leadership vacuum that was in the Nation of Islam when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spent five years in federal penitentiary. It was Mother Clara Muhammad, you see? Mm -hmm. And, and the, the other, because there were many brothers who were locked up at that time. See, people talk about Muhammad Ali, he didn't, you know, he refused to draft. Hey, well, that wasn't exceptional. I refused to draft. Mm -hmm. Every FOI that I know refused to draft. Mm -hmm. That's why I was so surprised when I talked about the brothers that were in the Navy, how the hell do I get in the Navy? <laughs> None okay. of us went in the military like that. You see, but the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the first one. He went to prison because he refused to participate in wars that took the lives of human beings. Yes, sir. Because he's a Muslim and we're Muslims. And so we refuse to participate in wars that take the lives of human beings. We refuse to kill anybody that Allah has not ordered to be killed. And Allah ain't never told me to kill nobody. Mm. 
You see? So, so who filled the leadership vacuum in the nation when the brothers faced prison time? It was the sisters. Same thing here in Washington, DC. I wish I had more details of some of the stories that uh, see, the other Clara, the other mother Clara was Sister Clara Muhammad here in Washington, DC. She was mm. the wife of Brother Benjamin Muhammad. They were the original uh, converts to Islam in Washington, D.C., along with uh, Brother Akbar Sharif. You mm. see, back in the 30s, I'm talking about back in the 30s, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad rented a room in their house. And so now Mother Clara, uh, she, she, she told me some of the stories of how the sisters um, used to literally run the mosque, run the nation. Mm. Because so many of the brothers were locked up. See, see, we, we forget our history. We fought for the right to educate our children. Now we neglect the right to educate our children. Like somebody didn't fight and bleed and die for that right. See, but these were the people that did it. So she was telling me one time, she said back in those days, she said the MGT used to wear um, fire engine red MGT uniforms. Mm. And they were doing some recruiting uh, one time down in South Carolina. See, this was back in like the 30s and 40s. Mm. Mm. Now her husband, Brother Benjamin, uh, he, he was a field minister for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. See, we don't have a field minister now, but he was a field minister for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. What does that mean? That means he went out into the fields. <laughs> where there was no mosque, where there was no study group, where there wasn't nothing. And he went there and taught the, the teachings. See, that, that's, that's people like Jeremiah Shabazz, who became a big minister in Philadelphia. He was a field minister mm, down mm. there in Alabama, down there in Mississippi, fighting the Klan. So Mother Clara, in other words, she told me they were down in South Carolina uh, doing something and the Klan decided they were gonna have a rally to run the Muslims out of town. Mm, mm, mm. And she said the sisters dressed in their red uniforms, she, she said they marched the Klan out of town. <laughs> See, they, that's, that's, how, that's how they were back then. Now, I don't have the details of that, but I'm telling you what she told me. So, so Winnie Mandela filled the leadership vacuum like she was supposed to. She was a soldier, she was a warrior. And she, she, she was and she did whatever she had to do to stand up for her husband and protect her husband. And more importantly, uh, to become the mother of a free South Africa. Mm. Excellent, Dr. Lynn. Yes, sir, praise be to a lot. Okay. Yeah, she was great, she was great. Well, speaking about that, how important is is the love of a woman in a in to a man who who this is his mission? How important is that for a woman? Like the woman's love. How important is that to a man to have the love of a woman who understands the man and his mission? Oh, that's that's the whole thing. Mm. A man without a woman is really not a man. Mm. How 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 can a man be a man by himself? Mm. Or by conversely. A woman by herself? No, no, no. What does the Quran say in Surah 4? That in the beginning, we were a single being mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and created its mate. That's right. Its, its mate. Its mate of the same essence. And then from these two, came many men and women. Yes, sir. So in other words, what we have now in existence is not what we had in the very beginning. See, Donald Elijah Muhammad said, we are not now what we were then. In the beginning, we were a single being, not male nor female, mm. but then we split into two. And from those two, you have many men 
and women. And we have rights by one another. Because the woman is divine, then the man has to respect the woman as divine. Almost to the degree of worship. I would say worship. Mm. Because again, we're talking with word technology. See, they changed the word uh, workship. See, the original word is workship. Mm. They changed it. They, take the, they took the K out and changed it to worship. See, idol worship. <laughs> mm, mm. Either I D O L or I D L E, idol worship. They took the work out of it. See, they took the work out of spirituality. They took the work out of relationships. So the man and woman should be in a workship relationship with one another, a workship mm -hmm. relationship. They are partners. As the great Reverend Bevel used to put it, see, marriage is all about a man and a woman who are prayer partners. They pray together. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They pray together. And then out of their prayer, they establish the kingdom of God. So they become partners in the raising of a family. It takes a father and a mother to raise children. It's not, there's no such thing as a single parent family. That, that's, that's, that's just nonsense of this wicked world because they don't want to admit they just destroyed your family and you haven't reconstituted it yet. So men and women are partners, prayer partners, parents as partners, business partners. Men and women establish institutions together, not separately. Schools are established by men and women who are parents, who are interested in the education of their children. Men mm. and women do that. Men and women establish clinics because their children get sick and women need to bear children and they have to have a safe environment. And so that's the beginning of a clinic. Men taking care of women, women taking care of their babies. That's a clinic and so on and so forth. The man and the woman, they produce their own food together. Yes, sir. They don't work for somebody else. They work for themselves, for one another. See, that's marriage. Now, we hardly know anything about marriage because we've been in a slave situation for 400 years. You can't be a slave and married at the same time. Mm, mm, mm. If you look at the marriage vows, the marriage vows are very clear. The man and the woman, they pledge themselves to one another. They pledge to obey one another. They pledge to keep to one another. But the very institution of slavery nullifies all of that. All of those vows become false because you're not free. So again, marriage is for free people. And so if you have a situation like in South Africa, or even the situation that we're in over here or any place that you want to name. What is it going to take to accomplish the goal of freedom? You have to have a free man in partnership with a free woman. And if you only have a slave man and, a, and with a slave woman, they're just going to produce another generation of slaves. Mm, mm, mm. So Nelson Mandela was a free man. He was locked up on Robben Island for 26 years, but he was still a free man. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Yes, sir. And before you know it, he was out of prison. Now, I won't say it before you know it, because 26 years is 26 years. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But that's really a short period of time to conquer a whole nation. He conquered South Africa. And Winnie Mandela was right there by his side. He was on the inside, she was on the outside. And she kept the flame of resistance burning while he was, you know, incarcerated. And so that's what we see, and that's what we need. We need that partnership between men and women, 
And a man without a woman ain't nothing. And a woman without a man ain't nothing. Mm. You know, and you don't get nothing uh, by yourself. But of course, that's part of the modern technology, isn't it? Yes, to make yes, a sir. woman think she's independent, don't need no man. Look at Tina Turner talking about what's love got to do with it. See, she wants to turn everybody into a prostitute. Mm. You see, what's love got to do with it? Love's got everything to do with it. Mm. And without love, you don't have anything. So they want to make, see, you got people thinking that marriage is all about sex. And a lot, a lot of righteous people too. They don't know the finer uh, attributes of marriage. Mm. They, they just think marriage is legalized fornication. No, no. What comes out of the marriage? See, is it children? Well, what kind of children? Are they hoodlums? Or are they engineers? Are they doctors? Are they people who make a positive contribution to society? See, anybody can have children, but who can raise children into responsible, civilized adults who are able to make a positive contribution to society? See, that takes a man and a woman working together to produce that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, where, where are the businesses? See, look at the MGT class, brother. See, they have the seven disciplines in the MGT class. Well, now each one of those disciplines relates to, some, to, to something that used to be called home economics. Mm, mm. See, so when the woman practices those seven disciplines, she's practicing home economics. Now, if you look at the English word economy or economists, it comes from the Greek word economos, spelled with a K, economos. Economos literally translates to mean household or farm. Mm, mm. So you see the point I'm making? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, the foundation of economic life is home family life where you have a woman in the home in partnership with a man. And they are practicing these seven disciplines that have to do with food, clothing, shelter, and the other necessities of life. And when they put these uh, practices into practice, out of that emerges a surplus. So you grow a garden for vegetables to feed your family, feed yourself. Well, Allah's going to bless you. He's not going to just give you enough food to feed yourself. Allah's going to give you so much food like we learned, you know, with the garden in Washington, D.C. He's going to give you so much abundance that you're going to have to either give it to, away to your friends and family or hungry people. Or you're going to go to the marketplace and you're going to exchange it for other goods or money. So in other words, what I'm saying is that the seven disciplines is the basis of economic development. Mm. So if you are a, a woman or a man and you are not in your home practicing those seven disciplines, how could you ever expect to have economic development? Mm. Economic development isn't working for somebody else in their home or in their factory or in their office. Economic development starts in the home and then spreads abroad. So, so many of our people for the last 400 years, even to the present day, Brother Joshua, uh, they don't have a home. They live somewhere, but they don't have a home. You know, they might be in relationships with people, but they're not married. Mm -hmm. They might have a piece of paper uh, that's a contract, but marriage is not on a piece of paper. See, you don't even need a marriage contract among righteous people. You only need a marriage contract when you're among unrighteous people who are unfaithful to one another. Mm. And then you need a legal contract because they're gonna be in court in front of a judge fighting and, and feuding over whatever scraps they may have accomplished together. But among righteous people, see, you don't need no marriage license. Mm. See, the marriage is in the heart. Why, why would I cheat on you? You're in my heart. Mm. 
Why would you cheat on me? I'm in your heart. You see, it, it becomes impossible. Infidelity becomes impossible when it's a true marriage. But if it's just legalized fornication, well, that doesn't last long. And that does not produce good children. That does not produce institutions. That does not produce schools. That does not produce clinics. It does not produce any of the things that support human life. So we, among ourselves, we have to reestablish the true meaning of marriage and get away from this. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't know what this thing is that they have going in this Western civil, civil, civilization, but it, it's 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 not true marriage because it does not lead to the development of children um, in the proper way, nor does it lead to the proper development of the society as a whole. So that can't be marriage. It's something mm -hmm. else. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent job. Like, we got two more questions for you. Is that okay, sir? Okay. Yes, sir. I'm yes, holding sir. on. Saying, yes, sir. People say, teach, brother, along with Muhammad. I'm about to turn my desk over. Come on, Allah, walk by. Oh, teach. This is powerful. Say that. Yes, sir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, who's who's watching? Um, okay. Um, thank you, everybody, who's showing love all across the country. All right. Uh, we've got two more questions. The let the next question I have is the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's relationship or uh, proximity to Carter G. Woodson in Washington D.C. What what was what is the correlation there with them being in D.C. together? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, see, Carter G. Woodson for people who don't know is considered to be the father of black history or Negro history, as it was called. When we have Negro History Month and Negro History Week, that was started by Carter G. Woodson. Now, Carter G. Woodson was not a scholar, meaning that he did not have a college degree, but he's the father of black history. And his books are the foundation of this whole expanded field called black history today. But what most people don't realize that he published a book, um, The Miseducation of the Negro, I believe it was 1933, 1934, um, when he lived on Ninth Street. And at the same time, directly across the street is where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to hold study groups. Mm. Uh, the last time I visited that place, it was a beauty shop there now in the lo location where the study group was. But if you go right across the street, there's a plaque on the wall, the Carter G. Woodson home. And then of course, right down the street, uh, half a block down the street is the monumental uh, Shiloh Baptist Church, mm. uh, which was one of the, well, even now, I mean, it's one of the, the foundational churches of Washington, D.C., all of it under the influence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad back in the 30s. Now, if you go further down the street, uh, you run right into Bible Way Church, which is the largest church in Washington, D.C. Mm. And that was founded by um, um, Bishop Smallwood Williams. Bishop mm. Smallwood Williams and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to hold religious debates on the street corner where the church now is. And of course, not only is Bible Way uh, Church the biggest church in Washington, DC, it's also one of the most advanced in terms of you know, uh, community development and whatnot. And of course, it, uh, Bible Way um, was the last church because it was the biggest church. It was the last church where we had an event featuring Minister Farrakhan. Mm. So the only thing that we could do after he appeared at Bible Way Church was to go after the DC Convention Center mm. because there's no church big enough anymore in Washington, DC to contain the crowds that wanted to come out and hear Minister Farrakhan. Yes. Oh, thank you so loud. Beautiful, yes sir, Dr. Alina. Thank you everyone who's watching. Yes, your nation is worthy of love. Thank you, everyone, who is showing love all across the country. And on that positive note, Dr. Aline, we want to thank Allah again for yourself and your family, all of the amazing work that you have done over years and years. 
may Allah continue to bless you, sir. Thank you. We 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 appreciate your uh, hard work. We appreciate your son Kush. We appreciate everyone, sir, who's in your family, your parents, your mother, father, your siblings, your siblings as <laughs> well, you. sir. I want to thank everyone who's watching. We want to put this on YouTube. This is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off for the People's Podcast. Assalamualaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir.